seventh turning point. To describe the seventh of the turning points in my life, I must go back to November 11, 1918, Armistice Day, the end of the World War. The war had left me without a penny, as I have already said, but I was happy to know that the slaughter had ceased and reason was about to reclaim civilization. The time had come for another turning point. I sat down at my typewriter, and to my astonishment, my hands began to play a tune on the keyboard. I had never written so rapidly or so easily before. I did not plan or think about what I was writing. I just wrote whatever came into my mind. What Hill wrote was a long essay in which he described a new idealism based on the golden rule that he thought could emerge from the war. He declared that he would help spread the word and promised that somehow he was going to find the money to launch a new magazine to be called Hill's Golden Rule. He took his essay to George Williams, a Chicago printer he had met while working at the White House, and by early January of 1919, Hill's Golden Rule magazine was on the newsstands. The first issue was 48 pages. In the beginning, with no money to pay anyone else, Hill wrote and edited every word himself, changing his writing style for each article as well as using a variety of pen names. Additional staff was hired later, which soon led to problems on the inside and on the outside, and Williams attempted to buy out Hill's share of the business. But when Hill realized that one stipulation of the buyout prevented him from any involvement in a competing publication, in October of 1920, he simply left. By April of 1921, he had raised the money for a new publication, Napoleon Hill's Magazine, the foundation of which was again the golden rule. But it also expanded into presenting many of the principles of success that would become the basis of Hill's later books. The magazine's acceptance and success also led to Hill's success as a speaker and motivator, which led to even greater success for the magazine. At the same time, Napoleon Hill was working with one of the inmates of a penitentiary to develop a correspondence course, which he took to the prisons to encourage prisoner rehabilitation. Most everything Hill did during this time was successful, and the success of the prison program was significant. But the greed of two members of the board of directors, one of whom was the prison chaplain, eventually led in 1923 to the demise of not only the educational rehabilitation programs, but also the magazine and numerous other successful offshoot ventures. The bleak irony, as Michael Ritt notes in A Lifetime of Riches, was that few enterprises in the 1920s could have been more idealistic or humanitarian in concept. Yet in seeking to stir goodness in men's souls, these enterprises had stirred mean-spirited men to a bloodlust that destroyed everything. Without his magazine, Hill went back to teaching and lecturing, which led to an introduction to a crusading newspaper publisher, Don Mellett, who offered to help Hill publish the results of his work on the Carnegie Project. At this same time, Mellett learned that Prohibition gangsters were selling narcotics and bootleg liquor to school children in Canton, and members of the local police force were being bribed to do nothing about it. Mellett was outraged and wrote an expose in his Canton Daily News while Hill contacted the governor to implement a state investigation of the corrupt police department. A week before Hill and Mellett were to finalize the financing for the publication of Hill's book, Don Mellett was ambushed outside his home and assassinated by a gangster and a renegade cop. They tried to kill Hill, too, but through pure luck he escaped and fled to the Smoky Mountains, where he remained holed up in a backwoods shack for most of a year. Destitute and in fear for his life, he lapsed into a state of deep depression. Then, in one extraordinary night of self-analysis, he willed himself out of his depression and resolved to finish the challenge Carnegie had posed almost twenty years earlier. Hill went to Philadelphia, convinced a publisher to put up the money, then worked night and day for almost four months to finish the manuscript. In March of 1928, Hill published the results of his efforts, a multi-volume masterwork entitled Law of Success. No one had ever seen anything like it. It was a phenomenon, a runaway bestseller. A little over a year later, while Hill was finally enjoying the fruits of his long labors, the stock market crash of 29 hit. 
the bottom fell out of everything, including the market for books. Though he never gave up on his vision, like the rest of America, Hill struggled through the Depression. He lectured, he wrote, and he taught in every way he could, but it was very hard to preach personal achievement to a country that had lost faith in itself. Napoleon Hill made it his personal mission to turn the tide by creating a variety of self-help programs, but it became disappointingly apparent that it was going to take more than one man to do it. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president, he reached out to Hill. Though Napoleon Hill was an avowed capitalist, he believed enough in the ultimate goal of FDR's policies that he committed himself to helping the new administration. Throughout the Depression years, he became a close confidant of the president's, helping to guide Roosevelt in his efforts to revitalize America. It is said that it was Hill who gave FDR the famous line, We have nothing to fear but fear itself. And though Hill was dead broke, just as he had done for President Wilson, he refused to accept more than one dollar a year for his efforts. In 1937, as America was finally beginning to see glimmerings of hope that the Great Depression might end, Hill convinced his publisher that America now needed a book to help shake off the mental and emotional stigma of those terrible times. He was right. They released Think and Grow Rich to such resounding success that it sold well over a million copies even before the Depression ended. At this writing, it has sold more than 60 million copies worldwide, and to this day it still sells more than a million copies a year in its various editions. Take Your Own Persistence Inventory Persistence is a state of mind. Therefore, it can be cultivated. Like all states of mind, persistence is based upon definite causes, among them these. Definiteness of Purpose Knowing what you want is the first and most important step toward the development of persistence. A strong motive will force you to surmount difficulties. Desire It is comparatively easy to acquire and maintain persistence in pursuing the object of intense desire. Self-reliance Belief in your ability to carry out a plan encourages you to follow the plan through with persistence. Self-reliance can be developed through the principle described in Chapter 5, Autosuggestion. Definiteness of Plans Organized plans, even ones that may be weak or impractical, encourage persistence. Accurate Knowledge Knowing that your plans are sound, based upon experience or observation, encourages persistence. Guessing, instead of knowing, destroys persistence. Cooperation. Sympathy, understanding, and cooperation with others tend to develop persistence. Willpower. The habit of concentrating your thoughts on making plans to attain your definite purpose leads to persistence. Habit. Persistence is the direct result of habit. The mind absorbs and becomes a part of the daily experiences upon which it feeds. Fear. The worst of all enemies can be overcome by forcing yourself to perform and repeat acts of courage. Everyone who has seen active service in war knows this. Take inventory of yourself and determine what you are lacking in this essential quality of persistence. Measure yourself point by point and see how many of the previous eight factors of persistence you lack. The analysis may lead to discoveries that will give you a new understanding of yourself and what you need to get ahead. The following is a list of the real enemies that stand between you and achievement. These are not only the symptoms indicating weakness of persistence, but also the deeply seated subconscious causes of this weakness. Study the list carefully, and face yourself squarely if you really wish to know who you are and what you are capable of doing. These are the weaknesses that must be mastered by anyone who really wants to accumulate riches. One, failure to recognize and to define clearly exactly what you want. Two, procrastination, with or without cause, usually backed up with a long list of alibis and excuses. Three, 
Lack of interest in acquiring specialized knowledge. 4. Indecision and the habit of passing the buck instead of facing issues squarely, also backed by alibis and excuses. 5. The habit of relying upon excuses instead of making definite plans to solve your problems. 6. Self-satisfaction. There is little remedy for this and no hope for those who suffer from it. 7. Indifference, usually reflected in your readiness to compromise rather than meet opposition and fight it. 8. The habit of blaming others for your mistakes and accepting circumstances as being unavoidable. 9. Weakness of desire because you neglected to choose motives that will push you to take action. 10. Willingness to quit at the first sign of defeat based upon one or more of the six basic fears. 11. Lack of organized plans that you have written out so they can be analyzed. 12. The habit of neglecting to act on ideas or to grasp opportunity when it presents itself. 13. Wishing instead of willing. 14. The habit of compromising with poverty instead of aiming at riches. A general lack of ambition to be, to do, or to own. 15. Searching for all the shortcuts to riches, trying to get without giving a fair equivalent, usually reflected in the habit of gambling or trying to drive unfair bargains. 16. Fear of criticism, resulting in failure to create plans and put them into action because of what other people might think, do, or say. This is one of your most dangerous enemies because it often exists in your subconscious mind and you may not even know it is there. See the six basic fears in the last chapter. If you fear criticism. Following is an examination of the symptoms of the fear of criticism. The majority of people permit relatives, friends, and the public at large to influence them so that they cannot live their own lives because they fear criticism. Many people make mistakes in marriage, but stay married, then go through life miserable and unhappy because they fear criticism. Anyone who has submitted to this form of fear knows the irreparable damage it does by destroying one's ambition and the desire to achieve. Millions of people neglect to go back and get an education after having left school because they fear criticism. Countless numbers of men and women permit relatives to wreck their lives in the name of family duty because they fear criticism. Duty does not require you to submit to the destruction of your personal ambitions and the right to live your own life in your own way. People refuse to take chances in business because they fear the criticism that may follow if they fail. The fear of criticism in such cases is stronger than the desire for success. Too many people refuse to set high goals for themselves because they fear the criticism of relatives and friends who may say, Don't aim so high, people will think you're crazy. When Andrew Carnegie suggested that I devote 20 years to the organization of a philosophy of individual achievement, my first impulse was fear of what people might say. His suggestion was far greater than anything I had ever conceived for myself. My first instinct was to create excuses, all of them traceable to the fear of criticism. Something inside of me said, You can't do it. The job is too big and requires too much time. What will your relatives think of you? How will you earn a living? No one has ever organized a philosophy of success. What right have you to believe you can do it? Who are you anyway to aim so high? Remember your humble birth. What do you know about philosophy? People will think you are crazy, and they did. Why hasn't some other person done this before now? These and many other questions flashed into my mind. It seemed as if the whole world had suddenly turned its attention to me with a purpose of ridiculing me into giving up all desire to carry out Mr. Carnegie's suggestion. Later in life, after having analyzed thousands of people, I discovered that most ideas are stillborn. To grow... Ideas need the breath of life injected into them through definite plans of immediate action. The time to nurse an idea is at the time of its birth. 
Every minute it lives gives it a better chance of surviving. The fear of criticism is what kills most ideas that never reach the planning and action stage. Breaks can be made to order. Many people believe that success is the result of lucky breaks. There may be something to that, but if you depend upon luck, you will almost surely be disappointed. The only break anyone can afford to rely on is a self-made break. These come through the application of persistence. The starting point is definiteness of purpose. Editor's Comments In 1999, Mark Myers, editor of one of the country's most influential self-help newsletters, Bottom Line Personal, wrote a book entitled How to Make Luck, Seven Secrets Lucky People Use to Succeed. In it, he tells of a study that was done by the psychology department at the University of Herefordshire near London. They assembled a group of people, half of whom either thought themselves lucky or were considered to be lucky by others. The other half of the group believed they were unlucky. They were all brought to campus to watch a computerized random coin toss. Each person watched as a cartoon elf came on screen and flipped a coin. Each was asked to call heads or tails. The results of the experiment proved that the unlucky group guessed right approximately the same number of times as the lucky group. In follow-up interviews, the researchers concluded that the only difference between so-called lucky and unlucky people was that the lucky people tended to remember the good things that had happened in their lives, and those that thought they were unlucky tended to dwell on the bad things. The scientific fact is that luck in terms of calling a coin toss, spinning a wheel, or turning a card is completely random, and there's nothing we can do about it. All we can control is what we say and do. Everything else that happens to us depends upon the actions of others and the random world in which we live. Then why do some people seem to be so lucky and get all the lucky breaks? Myers says it is because, unlike luck, lucky breaks are something you can control. And lucky people, whether they know it or not, have taken specific steps to make their good luck. You can influence lucky breaks in two ways. You have to intentionally put yourself in luck's way, and you must make people want to help you because they believe that you deserve their help. Once you have let the world know you are ready for a break, Luck is largely a matter of being introduced to opportunities by people who open doors for us. Myers calls these people gatekeepers. Gatekeepers offer help not only out of goodwill, but also because they hope you will help them in return when you are in a position to do so. People who are lucky make it a point to impress their gatekeepers so that they will be the first to come to mind when opportunities arise. Your gatekeepers must believe that you deserve a break and that it is worth it to them to give you one. One of the best ways to do that is simply to behave and act lucky. If you act like a loser, people think you are a loser. If you perceive yourself as lucky, it will be easier for others to see you that way. And if you are believed to be a lucky person, your chances of receiving lucky opportunities will increase partly because others hope some of your luck will rub off on them. This is the biggest secret lucky people know. They know that when they seem lucky, more people want to help them. There are people waiting to make a difference in your life if you show them you are willing to make an effort and that you are enthusiastic. Mark Meyer's book is devoted to explaining ways to do that. As Hill says, the only lucky break anyone can afford to rely upon is a self-made break. These come through the application of persistence. The starting point is definiteness of purpose. This is the end of the editor's comments. If you stop the first hundred people you meet on the street and ask them what they want most in life, 98 of them would not be able to tell you. If you press them for an answer, some will say security, many will say money, a few will say happiness, and others will say fame and power. Some might tell you they want social recognition, ease in living, the ability to sing, dance, or write. 
but none of them will be able to give you the slightest indication of a plan by which they hope to attain these vaguely expressed wishes. Riches do not respond to wishes. They respond only to definite plans backed by definite desires through constant persistence. How to Develop Persistence There are four simple steps that lead to the habit of persistence. They call for no great amount of intelligence, no particular amount of education, and little time or effort. These necessary steps are 1. A definite purpose, backed by a burning desire for its fulfillment. 2. A definite plan, expressed in continuous action. 3. A mind closed tightly against all negative and discouraging influences, including negative suggestions of relatives, friends, and acquaintances. 4. A friendly alliance with one or more persons who will encourage you to follow through with both plan and purpose. These four steps are essential for success in all walks of life. An important purpose of the 13 principles of this philosophy is to enable you to take those four steps as a matter of habit. They are steps by which you may control your economic destiny. They are steps that lead to freedom and independence of thought. They are steps that lead to riches in small or great quantities. They are steps that lead the way to power, fame, and worldly recognition. They are four steps that guarantee favorable breaks. They are steps that convert dreams into physical realities. They are steps that lead also to the mastery of fear, discouragement, indifference. There is a magnificent reward for anyone who learns to take these four steps. It is the privilege of writing your own ticket and of making life yield whatever price is asked. How to Master Difficulties What mystical power gives people of persistence the capacity to master difficulties? Does the quality of persistence set up in your mind some form of spiritual, mental, or chemical activity that gives you access to supernatural forces? Does infinite intelligence throw itself on the side of the person who still fights on when the whole world seems to be against them? These and many other similar questions were in my mind as I watched Henry Ford start from scratch and build an industrial empire with little more than persistence. Or Thomas A. Edison, who, with less than three months of schooling, became the world's leading inventor. He turned his persistence into sound recording and playback machines, motion picture cameras and projectors, and the incandescent light, to say nothing of half a hundred other useful inventions. I had the opportunity to analyze both Mr. Edison and Mr. Ford up close and personal, year by year, over a long period of time. So I speak from actual knowledge when I say that I found no quality except persistence in either of them that even remotely suggested the major source of their stupendous achievements. If you make an impartial study of the prophets, philosophers, and religious leaders of the past, you will come to the inevitable conclusion that persistence, concentration of effort, and definiteness of purpose were the major sources of their achievements. Consider, for example, the fascinating story of Muhammad. Analyze his life. Compare him with men of achievement in this modern age of industry and finance and observe how they all have one outstanding trait in common, persistence. If you want to understand more about the power of persistence and how it works, I strongly suggest that you read a biography of Muhammad. Editor's Comments At the beginning of the 21st century, there was an increased interest in Islam due to the attacks on the World Trade Center and the subsequent war on terror. Consequently, the modern reader will have no difficulty finding a number of very good books about Muhammad. At the time that Hill was writing the first edition of Think and Grow Rich, one of the best biographies of Muhammad was written by Esad Bey, who was born in Baku, Azerbaijan, the son of a Jewish businessman named Nussenbaum. Later, he changed his name when he converted to Islam. During the Russian Revolution, he fled his home for Berlin, where he lived until the rise of Hitler again forced him to move, first to Austria and then finally to Italy. It is believed by some that this man known as Esad Bey 
also wrote under another pen name, Kurban Said, and was in fact the author of the acclaimed Azerbaijani novel, Ali and Nino. That Napoleon Hill was very impressed with this particular biography of Mohammed is clear from his recommendation, which follows. I strongly suggest that you read a biography of Mohammed, especially the one by Esad Bey. This brief review of that book, which appeared in the Herald Tribune, will provide a preview of the rare treat in store for those who take the time to read the entire story of one of the most astounding examples of the power of persistence known to civilization. The Last Great Prophet Reviewed by Thomas Sugru Mohammed was a prophet, but he never performed a miracle. He was not a mystic. He had no formal schooling. He did not begin his mission until he was forty. When he announced that he was the messenger of God, bringing word of the true religion, he was ridiculed and labeled a lunatic. Children tripped him, and women threw filth upon him. He was banished from his native city, Mecca, and his followers were stripped of their worldly goods and sent into the desert after him. When he had been preaching ten years, he had nothing to show for it but banishment, poverty, and ridicule. Yet before another ten years had passed, he was dictator of all Arabia, ruler of Mecca, and the head of a new world religion which was to sweep to the Danube and the Pyrenees before exhausting the impetus he gave it. That impetus was threefold. The power of words, the efficacy of prayer, and man's kinship with God. Yeah! I'm Rosaribe Mike. Promotional cup. Kashiruyal. The band. Sinti Dushi, Sinti Dushi, Viva Pai.